More preserved soft tissues and fossils that haven't evolved, and a technical question on thermodynamics in the mailbag. This is Genesis Week. And a welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary and analysis on news, views, and events pertaining to the origins controversy, made possible by you, the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education. Excellence in Pirate Broadcasting, Genesis Week is the show of choice for intellectuals who believe that their brain was intelligently designed. Airing right across Canada on the Miracle Channel all over the world on Roku via the Genesis Science Network, the Good News Station in Lansing, Michigan, and of course on the Chris Jinnaman Network on YouTube. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in genesisweek.com where you can find us, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and get extras like Crevo Rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. A few weeks back, a paper appeared in Scientific Reports, Nature's open source journal, documenting some fossil caddisfly silk larval click cases found in Brazil. Now, the caddisfly is still around today, of course, even found right here in North America. The adults lay eggs in a gelatinous mass in water. The eggs hatch, and the pupae are then proceed to build silk cocoons like moths and butterflies. The pupae will often incorporate sand, shells, plants, all kinds of things into the shell of their cocoon, which they usually attach to something underwater. The pupae develop, emerge from the cocoon to the surface where they shed their outer shell and immediately able to fly. Moiro et al. found some of the fossilized silk cocoons of caddisflies and Permian rocks, assigned the age of some 295 million evolutionary years old, give or take a week. Now, how did they know these were caddisfly cocoons? Cause they look just like caddisfly cocoons. So it would appear that 295 million years of evolution has caused the caddisfly to evolve into the caddisfly. There's no evolution going on over here. And just remember during that time frame, according to the evolution myth, Land creatures had just evolved from the fishes and evolved into all land walking creatures, including us. And they had gone back into the sea to evolve into sea mammals. Why did the caddis fly not evolve while everything else did? Well, the short answer is because there is no evolution. What we see here is precisely what we see everywhere in the fossil record, stasis and extinction. Stasis being the creatures stay the same and don't change, and extinction of being, of course, the end of species. Neither of these is of any help whatsoever to evolution. One does not bring around the arrival of new species. The other leads to the removal of species. This is what is consistently found in the fossil record. Also found were some spectacular fossil animals captured in amber from the Myanmar province in Asia. Lizards, chameleons, and geckos were found preserved in fossil amber dated 99 evolutionary, million evolutionary years old. Published in the open access journal Science Advances, the stunning finds are astonishingly well preserved, right down to the scales you can see in these phyto photomicrographs. Wow! 99 million years old. I think they should carbon date those fossils, don't you? Geckos are well known for their wall climbing abilities with fascinating adhesive toe pads that actually inspired multiple studies and attempts to imitate this ability with technology. Well, the fossil geckos in amber had those same adhesive toe pads. So how did they know it was a gecko? Because it looks just like one. 99 million years of evolution has caused the incredibly well-designed gecko to evolve into the gecko. The chameleon fossil was especially interesting as the allegedly oldest fossil chameleon found so far 
was only dated 19 million evolutionary years old. The BBC report even labeled this fossil chameleon a missing link because it was some 80 million evolutionary years older than the oldest chameleon. Yet, how did they know it was a chameleon? Because it looks just like one. Nothing has changed. Also published in the Science of Nature magazine, Engel et al. reported on a fossil microwhip scorpion preserved again in amber, dated 100 million evolutionary years old. Given a new name, Electrocoenia yaksha, it is basically identical to the completely modern microwhip scorpion. So much so that Science Daily even said, because it looks so similar to other microwhip scorpions still found today, it most probably shared the same habitat and preferences as its modern day kin. Vance Nelson actually first pointed this out in his book, Flood Fossils. Fossil specimens identical to their modern counterparts are often given a different name than their modern counterpart, often not even the same genus. Why? Once again, 100 million years of evolution has caused the microwhip scorpion to change in only one way, its name. Names which were assigned, presumably to give the impression of change and thus evolution, when there is no change or evolution. What do we really see in the fossil record? Stasis and extinction neither of which are one bit of help to evolution and affirm the biblical account of creation, where ten times in the first chapter of Genesis, it says God created life to reproduce after its kind. What we see in the fossil record is the caddisfly, geckos, chameleons, and the microwhip scorpion, all faithfully reproducing after their kind. Also notice that as we have reported here on Genesis Week, dozens of examples of preserved original biomaterials have been found from the fossil record in the form of uh, bone cells, blood vessels, even blood cells. We can now add silk to that list of incredibly preserved original biomaterials found in fossils alleged to be almost 300 million years old. Hogwash! Silk could not possibly remain preserved in that condition for even 1 million years, let alone 300 million years. I challenge the researchers to date all of the fossils here with carbon dating. I predict they will return an age of between 5,000 and 50,000 years old. All of them. Interestingly, these fossils in amber bring up an interesting point. We find copious amounts of fossil insects preserved in huge amounts of amber. Now, amber is like tree sap, uh, like pine gum, which was been compressed into a hard plastic-like substance. We find so much amber in the fossil record, usually in large fossil beds. Why? We don't find such fossils or such large amber beds being made today. However, if we assume that the fossil record was formed by a worldwide flood, as the Bible mentions, then amber deposits make complete sense. We would have seen massive amounts of smashed, uprooted, and broken trees floating in massive log beds all over the world. Animals and insects trying to seek refuge on these floating rafts would have been stuck in the copious amounts of amber seeping out of the broken trunks in these massive log mats. The logs themselves would eventually sink, as well as the amber, being buried and preserved in what is now the fossil record. It all makes complete sense within the biblical timeline. The biblical flood was the first judgment against mankind. For 120 years, they were warned of the judgment to come, and all they had to do was get on the ark. They didn't, and they paid the price accordingly. God did not want to punish evil, but did because it was just. All they had to do was obey. Now you are challenged to obey again with a warning of a judgment to come, which Jesus compared to that flood of Noah. Jesus said to escape the coming judgment, you must be born again. This is just simply believing on Jesus, asking him to forgive you of your sins and giving your life wholly to him. Why haven't you done that today? Is the next judgment going to come when you least expect it? 
and sweep you away much like it did with the people at the time of the flood? Stick around, we'll be back in one minute. Now in its second edition, Chronicles of Dinosauria is a beautiful coffee table reader that is sure to provoke fascinating discussions amongst all ages. Chronicles of Dinosauria takes the reader from creation to modern times from the perspective of the great reptiles and presents compelling evidence that dinosaurs and man lived together, just like the Bible says. In scrapbook style, author David Wetzel presents the biblical, historical, and fossil evidence with photos and beautiful drawings by artist Richard Dobbs. See evidence that humans are found in the fossil record right back to the time of the dinosaurs. The book culminates with fresh research into modern-day reports of dinosaurs living in remote areas like Papua New Guinea and the rainforests of Cameroon. You can get your own beautiful hardcover copy for only $16.99 plus shipping by going to genesispark.com or from any of the major online booksellers. For me? Joseph wrote in, Wow, how intellectually dishonest you and your organization behave when it comes to cognitive dissonance. Well, thanks for writing in, Joseph. For those of you who don't know what cognitive dissonance is, it was described by Leon Festinger in 1954 as, quote, the feeling of psychological discomfort produced by the combined presence of two thoughts that do not follow from one another. For instance, you can see cognitive dissonance clearly in the lives of atheists. There is no God, and I hate that God. Joseph, how is that not an intellectually honest example of cognitive dissonance? Now, you didn't provide any specific details about what you were talking about, so I'm only left to assume you said what you did because I said something that pointed out two different thoughts you had which didn't follow one from another, and caused you some discomfort. A number of critics wrote in response to our Creator Gate episode, basically saying that God or Creator had no place in scientific papers. Thus, the paper published by Plus One should have been rejected. Well, apparently, you guys missed my point, so let me reiterate. If Isaac Newton was alive today, his papers would have been rejected from scientific publication based on your erroneous claim. If Charles Darwin was alive today, his papers would be rejected from publication based upon your erroneous claim. Furthermore, you critics have claimed that only naturalism should be allowed in scientific publications. That's hypocrisy of the highest order, as evolutionism makes claims completely contrary to natural observations. Now, I, I realize many of you will choke on this statement, and I apologize for being so broad in saying it, but I would simply refer you to my short and simple Crevo rants on the various topics. Crevo rant number 41, define evolution. Crevo rant number 110, natural selection. Crevo rant number 63, abiogenesis and evolution. And Crevo rants number 93 and 94, frogs are useful, part one and two. The evolution myth is just that. It is not only unscientific, it is anti-science mythology. It requires the absolute violation of well-established scientific and natural laws. That makes it a supernatural process, by very definition of the word. And thus, evolutionism should not be permitted in scientific journals at all. The evolution myth requires observations from the natural sciences that have never been made. And in fact, the opposite observations have been made. Evolutionism has simply conformed to the evidence, because evolution is not science, but mythology. So by your stipulations then, evolution should not even be mentioned in scientific papers. Steve wrote in, 
I would like to get some quickly stated overview I can stand on, indicating that the second law disallows evolution. Thank you for your video on entropy. If this is possible to easily answer, please do. In your video, Mark Isaacs says the Earth is not a closed system. Why couldn't the context be considered the whole universe? If there was only the Earth and the Sun in the universe, that would be counted as closed, right? Why would adding other planets' suns negate that? with regard to spontaneous life or evolution of life on Earth. Bless you. Well, thanks for writing in, Steve. I did deal with this in detail in Genesis Week, Season 2, Episode 4, which was devoted to thermodynamics as it applies to creation and evolution. The second law of thermodynamics deals with the flow of heat. Thermodynamics. Heat will always flow from a hotter region to a colder region. This is called entropy. Also, all energy is being converted into waste background heat over time. Once all energy has become waste background heat, evenly distributed throughout the universe, there is no more energy available for anything. The universe has undergone what they call a heat death, and we should be working, and we're working towards that right now. I figure it should take another week at least. Entropy is complete. You cannot get any more entropy. The connection to creation and evolution is not immediately evident, but it is profound and significant. Cells require directed energy in order to build and maintain themselves, as well as to operate. The first place the second law had direct impact on the creation-evolution debate has to do with the origin of the first life. Now, Anti-creationists will try and cop out, saying that evolution does not attempt to explain the origin of the first life, only the origin of the species. That is bait and switch and nonsense. Trying to escape the glaring problem of abiogenesis. Open any high school or university textbook on evolution, and it will include a section on the origin of the first life. Now, it goes way beyond that, but I deal with that in particular detail in Crevorant number 63, Abiogenesis and Evolution. If you don't have life, you can't even get off the starting line. But the second law has immediate application here on the origin of the first life. The first life would have to have arisen from rocks, basically. Uh, minerals in the water of the lifeless world, combining together to make amino acids, which combine together to make proteins, uh, all of those events require not just energy, but directed energy. In Carivo Rant number 94, Frogs Are Useful, part two, I got into <laughs> a lot of trouble because of my video on special effects. So this is fake, completely fake. What you're about to see is fake. It is special effects, that's all. I let the frog go completely unharmed back into the creek by my house. So, if we were to take a blender and take a frog and turn Mr. Frog into Mr. Frog Soup, we have just taken a quantum leap over the problem of the first life. In our soup, we've got amino acids by the billions, proteins, enzymes, <laughs> entire cells in that soup. Now, as he pointed out, Mark Isaacs pulls out the open system card as if that somehow answers the problem of the second law of thermodynamics. Now, open system in thermodynamic terms simply means that you have a system, like Earth's biosphere, where you have energy coming in from an outside source, in this case, the sun. A closed system might be a really, really well-insulated sealed box where no heat can enter or leave the inside of the box. The inside of the box would be a closed system. Well, first of all, this is bait and switch on the part of Isaacs because closed systems do not exist. You will never get a box or biosphere or any contained environment where he cannot enter or leave the system. Doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. We base our laws on thermodynamics on what we have observed in open systems. So why, pray tell, did Isaacs and other anti-creationists bring up open systems? We have learned the laws of thermodynamics from open systems. So why bring up 
closed or open systems as if that somehow demonstrates that the laws of thermodynamics don't apply to open systems. It's completely irrelevant to the discussion. And either complete and deliberate obfuscation by the anti-creationists or complete ignorance of the subject matter. It is nothing more than a distraction and shows that Isaacs doesn't even know what he's talking about. Of course Earth is an open system. And of course there's energy coming in from to Earth's system. Who cares? Let's give Isaacs uh, whatever he wants. He wants an open system with the sun providing energy, no problem. Take our frog soup and put it out in the sun. Seal it off from the biological environment so the only thing we have in there is our frog soup. Will those dead cells come to life because of energy from the sun? No, in fact, the energy from the sun will accelerate the decay of the cells, proteins, amino acids, etc. This is the second law of thermodynamics in action. So to produce the first life, you have to violate these observations, which are so well established, they have become a scientific and natural law. Let's add a different form of energy, electrical energy. Will that bring our cells back to life? Nope. What about heat energy? like a torch. Will that help bring the dead back to life? Nope. It all deteriorates the biological entities faster. Forget about trying to put minerals together into the impossible biological configurations. See Crevorant number 107, Mathematical Impossibility of Evolution. So forget that problem. We're just trying to get a dead cell back to life. So all of this talk of open systems is utter nonsense because A, closed systems don't exist, and B, energy coming into open systems accelerates the thermodynamic processes. It does not reverse them. Furthermore, while a plant, for instance, can take energy from the sun, carbon dioxide, water, and minerals, and use all of that to build cells, this is not a reversal of thermodynamic laws. It does this with machines. Now, they are biological machines, but machines by every definition of the word. And like any machine, they consume energy to make parts, but they consume more energy than what goes into the part. Uh, friction in the machinery produces heat, consumes some of the energy, converting that energy into waste background heat, exactly in line with the second law. The energy that goes into making the part the biological molecule, for instance. When that life dies, those parts fall apart, and the energy that went into them is released back into the universe as waste background heat. The second law of thermodynamics is never violated or reversed. The part itself, say a protein, may have a higher energy state locally, energy that was put into that part. Well, that's almost like thermodynamics was reversed. The, th the energy state went up, not down. As Professor of Thermodynamics Andrew McIntosh pointed out in multiple papers, the only time this is ever accomplished is by the use of a machine, be it biological, like the ATP synthase machine in your body, or the refrigerator in your kitchen, which cools the interior and transfers heat outside of the fridge. The heat flowed from inside of the fridge to outside from a cooler state to a hotter state. You will never find a situation where thermodynamics are even locally reversed unless there is a machine involved. The problem is machines require pre-existing machines to build them because machines don't arise from minerals being exposed to sunlight. It requires directed energy to build a machine and information. DNA, for instance, contains the blueprints for all of the biological machines you will ever find. But DNA is composed of molecules which fall apart, according to the second law of thermodynamics. Now, there are machines in your body which do nothing but run around and repair and maintain your DNA to keep it from falling apart. But the plans for those machines came from the DNA. So which came first, the DNA or the machines that make and repair the DNA, which were made from the plants contained within the DNA? But notice also that the information contained within the DNA is outside of the DNA. In other words, the DNA was assembled 
by the information that was imposed on it. That information can be stored and transmitted in multiple ways. You can download it off the internet. That information is stored as magnetic stripes on a hard drive, converted into electrical pulses, converted into light pulses, transmitted across fiber optic line to your house, where it is converted back into electrical pulses and converted back into magnetic stripes on your hard drive. You can print that information out on paper. So that's ink and paper. In all of these cases, the information was imposed upon the medium, whether it was a magnetic disc, light waves, electrons, ink and paper, etc. Information only comes from a higher source of information. So this information had to have come from a higher source of information that is not subject to the laws of thermodynamics. In other words, an extra natural entity of supreme intelligence. Notice that all of these systems are subject to the second law of thermodynamics, where if they are left to themselves, the hard drive, the ink and paper, the fiber optic cable, even the light itself deteriorates and becomes waste background heat. And if you add energy, like sunlight in an open system, <laughs> it all deteriorates faster. The information is outside of and imposed on the medium, which is subject to deterioration according to thermodynamics. So even though life can make localized areas of lower thermodynamic energy, it only does this because of pre-existing information, which had to have come from a supreme information source, a supreme intelligence who is outside of the natural realm because we are slowly losing all of that information over time because of the natural law, the second law of thermodynamics. Okay. I don't know if that was a concise response you were looking for, Stephen, this complicated subject, but as you can see, it is profound evidence of our creator. All right. I'm going to call that a wrap. I'm your host, Ian Juby. Remember, you can send us your comments, questions, hate mail, and letter bombs, as well as any Willy Wonka golden tickets you have to us in a number of ways. You can email us at comments at genesisweek.com, or you can send us a tweet at genesisweek. Or you can head on over to genesisweek.com, find the most recent show, and leave a comment there. Or you can go to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash genesisweektv. Remember those words of warning and comfort from our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We'll see you on the flip side. We are a viewer-supported program and need your support to keep this program on the air. Please pray for us, and if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K 2P4. While we cannot offer tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, donors wishing to financially support the program can do so online at ianjuby.org donations, and thank you for your support. Thank you.